Good evening. Well, if we had this kind of turn out the polls, I think our nation would be okay. <laughs> so go home and watch the debates tonight. Tonight, I could speak of the intense embodiment and equal and opposite boundlessness of the works the authors may read from tonight, of the globe-like O's of their openness, of Natalie Diaz's post-colonial love poem, how open the title itself makes our mouths, and of the gorgeousness in French, gorge literally means throat, the great throat, in other words, of Ocean Vong's sustained and consummate avowal. I could speak of the, quote, bodies of flesh, language, land, and water. The poets celebrate and integrate their influx and efflux, bodies leaving themselves for themselves. Of time, this time, that time, as Ocean iterates, and of timelessness of the pre-verbal and of what is not yet post, as one theorist writes of the term post-colonial, since the desecrations and discrimination still occur. I could speak of the great towardness of these works, both of them directed in a prolonged and sustained migration toward a you, a you that is still and still moving be it toward a mother or a lover, toward freedom or the unfettered reception of a single creature or being. The direction does not die. But instead, because love will be in such abundance tonight, I thought I'd take a moment to focus on friendship, because it is a friendship that forms the very core of tonight's reading, that constitutes it, a friendship between the two readers who wanted to read together and commingle their voices in this beautiful space. And I should thank the Harvard Art Museums for this remarkable space. What is, a poet once asked, the constitution between friends? Constitution with a capital C. Friendship is, to a certain extent, our first election, our first chosen formation. In English, friends come from the same root as freedom. In Mojave, Natalie tells me friendship is a word that relates to the body itself, perhaps a sense of membership with the body. Tonight is a celebration of friendship and of the great free forms or free verse that our relations can take. In honor of friendship and community, we'll be hosting a reception afterwards over at the poetry room with food and wine and chance to truly commune. I hope you'll make the journey down Quincy Street afterwards. But for now, please join us in welcoming Natalie Diaz and Ocean Vong, who will read in that order. I want to hold on. I walk in them. Hakulo imanch, Phoenix imanch. Gracias por venir. It's my luck uh, to be here tonight. Um, gracias, uh, Christina, Mary, Molly, um, and all of you for uh, for being with us. It's always lucky to to be um, around Ocean to to hear Ocean's work. And the last time I. I had said this on social media the last time I saw Ocean and Peter, they were on their way out this way. So I think they had bags in tow when that happened. Um, something else I just wanted to mention, because this was something I thought about uh, when I decided to come here, is that I, I did sign uh, the petition for Dr. Garcia Pena. And I am, this book is a book and the questions this book is asking are questions that would be asked in an ethnic studies program. Um, and uh, you know that's something I always want to try to be clear with. We, we sometimes think poetry is a, a small thing, but um, it can be made big in, in certain places and in certain instances. And so um, I came here knowing that um, yeah, that my thoughts are with her and that I'm also um, thinking about this place in that context and in those conditions. Post-colonial love poem. 
I've been taught bloodstones can cure a snake bite, can stop the bleeding. Most people forgot this when the war ended. The war ended depending on which war you mean. Those we started before those millennia ago and onward. Those which started me, which I lost and won. These ever blooming wounds. I was built by wage. So I wage love and worse. Always another campaign to march across a desert night for the cannon flash of your pale skin, settling in a silver lagoon of smoke at your breast. I dismount my dark horse, bend to you there, deliver you the hard pull of all my thirsts. I learn to drink in a country of drought. We pleasure to hurt, leave marks the size of stones, each a cabochon polished by our mouths. I, your lapidary, your lapidary wheel turning green, mottled red, the jaspers of our desires. There are wild flowers in my desert which take up to twenty years to bloom. The seeds sleep like geodes beneath hot feldspar sand until a flash flood bolts the arroyo, lifting them in its copper current, opens them with memory. They remember what their God whispered into their ribs. Wake up and ache for your life. Where your hands have been are diamonds on my shoulders, down my back, thighs. I am your culebra. I am in the dirt for you. Your hips are quartz light and dangerous, two rose-horned rams ascending a soft desert wash before the November sky untethers a hundred-year flood. The desert returns suddenly to its ancient sea. Arise the wild heliotrope, scorpion weed, blue phacelia, which hold purple the way a throat can hold the shape of any great hand. Great hands is what she called mine. The rain will eventually come or not. Until then, we touch our bodies like wounds. The war never ended and somehow begins again. Bloodlight. My brother has a knife in his hand. He has decided to stab my father. This could be a story from the Bible if it wasn't already a story about stars. I weep alacranes. The scorpions clatter to the floor like yellow metallic scissors. They land upside down on their backs and eyes, but writhe and flip to their segmented bellies. My brother has forgotten to wear shoes again. My scorpions circle him, whip at his heels. In them is what stings in me. It brings my brother to the ground. He rises, still holding the knife. My father ran out of the house, down the street, crying like a lamplighter, but nobody turned their lights on. The only light left is in the scorpions. There is a small light left in the knife, too. My brother now wants to give me the knife. Some might say my brother wants to stab me. He tries to pass it to me like it is a good thing, like don't you want a little light in your belly, like the way Orion and Scorpius across all that black night pass the sun. My brother loosens his mouth between his teeth, throbbing red on Terry's, one way to open a body to the stars with a knife, one way to love a sister, help her bleed light. I was a basketball player for a lot of my life. Um, I played, I've still played basketball longer than I'm not. So I have this habit of when I drink water, I usually do this, I'm like. <laughs> and then often people will point that out to me and so I'm trying to be more or less, I'm trying to be less of that as I drink water, so. 
that first elegance was for you. <laughs> Catching copper. My brothers have a bullet. They keep their bullet on a leash shiny as a whip of blood. My brothers walk their bullet with a limp, a clipped hip bone. My brother's bullet is a math head, is all geometry, from a distance is just a bee and its sting. Like a bee, you should see my brother's bullet make a comb by chewing holes in what is sweet. My brothers lose their bullet all the time. When their bullet takes off on them, their bullet leaves a hole. My brothers search their houses, their bodies for their bullet, and a little red ghost moans. Eventually, my brothers call out, here, bullet, here. Their bullet comes running, buzzing. Their bullet always comes back to them. When their bullet comes back to them, their bullet leaves a hole. My brothers are too slow for their bullet because their bullet is in a hurry and wants to get the lead out. My brother's bullet is dressed for a red carpet in a copper jacket. My brothers tell their bullet, careful you don't hurt somebody with all that flash. My brothers kiss their bullet in a dark cul-de-sac in front of the corner store ice machine in the passenger seat of their car on a strobe-lighted dance floor. My brother's bullet kisses them back. My brothers break and dance for their bullet, the jerk, the stanky leg, they pop, lock, and drop for their bullet, a move that has them writhing on the ground. The worm, my brothers call it. My brothers go all worm for their bullet. My brother's bullet is registered, is a bullet of letters, has a PD, a CIB, a GSW, if they are lucky, an EMT, if not, a triple nine, a DNR, a DOA. My brothers never call the cops on their bullet and instead pledge allegiance to their bullet with hands over their hearts and stomachs and throats. My brothers say they would die for their bullet. If my brothers die, their bullet would be lost. If my brothers die, there's no bullet to begin with. The bullet is for living brothers. My brothers feed their bullet the way the bulls fed Zeus, burning on a pyre, their own thigh bones wrapped in fat. My brothers take a knee, bow against the asphalt, prostrate on the concrete for their bullet. We wouldn't go so far as to call our bullet a prophet, my brothers say. But my brother's bullet is always lit like a night church. It makes my brothers holy. You could say my brother's bullet cleans them, the way red ants wash the empty white bowl of a dead coyote's eye socket. Yes, my brother's bullet cleans them, makes them ready for God. Um, it, it's been a couple, I've spent the last two days like talking myself into getting on the plane. Um, I have, I've had anxiety since I was little and sometimes it's, it, I never really know what, what it's going to do with me. Um, and sometimes as a poet I think like there must be something I can do with language that's more than what I'm doing. I think that's sometimes one of the, the questions, you know, I wake up in the morning and it's like, I'm a poet, like what does that even mean? Um, and so for me, like, one of the things I've been trying to do with this new book is I've tried to imagine that I can touch and hold every body in the book as if it were the body of the beloved, um, whether that's the brother who I write about who is, you know, not my real brother, but is based on the ways I interact with my real brother, whether it's a, a, a country that, you know, has tried its best to, to erase me, and sometimes it comes down to, to me, you know, what can poetry offer me that I might be able to hold myself or love myself in a way um, that makes me more possible. And so with this next poem, I was really, um, I was trying to think about if I could turn something like anxiety, you know, what if I, what if I used language and I tried to, um, well, what if I call my anxiety desire? How would that shift in my body? How would that make me be more or less possible? Um, 
<clears throat> From the Desire Field. I don't call it sleep anymore. I'll risk losing something new instead. Like you lost your rose and moon, shook it loose. But sometimes when I get my horns in a thing, a wonder, a grief, or a line of her, it is a sticky and ruined fruit to unfasten from, despite my trembling. Let me call my anxiety desire then. Let me call it a garden. Maybe this is what Lorca meant when he said, Verde, que te quiero verde. Because when the shade of night comes, I am a field of it, of any worry ready to flower in my chest. My mind in the dark is una bestia, unfocused, hot, and if not yoked to exhaustion beneath the hip and plow of my lover, then I am another night wandering the desire filled bewildered in its low green glow, belling the meadow between midnight and morning. Insomnia is like spring that way, surprising and many petaled, the kick and leap of gold grasshoppers at my brow. I am struck in the witched hours of want. I want her green life, her inside me in a green hour I can't stop. Green vein in her throat, green wing in my mouth, green thorn in my eye. I want her like a river goes, bending, green, moving, green, moving. Fast as that, this is how it happens. Soy una sonambula. And even though you said today you felt better, and it is so late in this poem. Is it okay to be clear, to say, I don't feel good? To ask you to tell me a story about the sweet grass you planted and tell it again or again until I can smell its sweet smoke, leave this thrashed field and be smooth? This was a this was the last poem I wrote for the book, um, and I'll read a couple more poems. Um, but this is a poem that has meant a lot to me, um, as I'm always like you know one of the things the book does is it questions you know what is what is American goodness, and who is it for, and the fact that I will never be good in America. And it's one of the reasons why I, I, I think that I played basketball. Um, and I was determined to be the best at it. And I was also determined to leave my reservation. Um, and those two things to me feel very close together, that, that the country I live in had convinced me that I needed to leave my reservation. Um, that in order for us sometimes to do the things we need to do, so that we are successful or so that we belong in this country, we have to leave the community and the family that are the closest to us. And it's something I'm still wrestling with. Um, and I grew up on a reservation where my neighbors were not just my neighbors, they were my family. Everyone in my community, um, you know, the way we learn autonomy is I can only be autonomous in relationship to the way I think about how I'm affecting everybody else in the room. Um, and so this poem is one I, I have grappled with a lot, and I, I haven't read it out loud, so this is, this is going to be one of the first times I, I read it. And one of the things that I was interested in doing is, is creating these turns that I feel like I'm constantly turning. I'm constantly trying to find a new way to reset, like, you know, what, how can I be good? How can I, how can I point out something that's wrong and not be considered hostile? How can I imagine a new way of thinking for myself so that I can feel whole in a moment in a room? Um, and so this character and is, is one who um, I'm drawn to. I also was trying to think a lot about my own real life brother and the way my brother has been labeled as bad, um, but that that was also prophesied for him by the nation that I live in. <clears throat> I, Minotaur, 
I am an invention, dark alarm, Briaris's hand striking the bells of my blood. Whose toll am I? I think too much, each morning the Minotaurumaki. Through the night I swing the sickle of my wonders, a harvest work of touch and worry. Spin dawn and its day burning my dead, who fell in the night, what the night reaped. I am every answer, a mathematics of anxiety, how any mall can solve the mesquite tree for the pyre. In my chest I am two-hearted always, love and what love becomes arrive when they want to, and hungry. The locusts disappeared the field than themselves. I bent, wept alone on the threshing floor, not for what went stick to the feast. I wept for the locusts. I know what it's like to be appetite of your own appetite, citizen of what savages you, to dare bloom pleasure from your wounds and to bleed out from that bouquet. A head like mine was shaped on thirst. I dream what is wet or might quench. Aquifers, rivers, cenotes, canals, the dusked mirage of lake above your knee I sip and lick. My tongue blush as the florest ear of a jackrabbit. I obey what I don't understand. Then I become it, which needs no understanding. The astonishment of my body's limits, how it is easily divided by a black field and the black field multiplied in stars, the throng of a lover constellating. Like any desert, I learn myself by what's desired of me, and I am demoned by those desires. For this I move like a wound, always and fruiting, sweetened by the thorn. The tumbleweed turns and turns until it bursts free all its spores into the wind, until it is only what it might become. There is no such thing as time or June, only what you're born into, only waiting for the rain, for the flood, for what erupts my bad lands and my tired eyes in beauty. Mojave Aster, desert globe mallow, where once was terrible nothing. There is no God here in these flesh hours, though your jaw is a temple and your hips strike like an axe, the labrys I injure myself against. But you, called to hear by me, come softly into the bull noon of my body, and not unknowingly. You've heard me churn and lather, yet knock and enter. Together we are the color of magnets, and also their doing. Manganese, lodestone, oars, the light will not touch, so we touch the light. Give it to one another until we are riddled and leaking with it. What else can we prostrate or set before the large feet of our ancestors if not the diminishment of the body, this book of scars? Sand grinds like gears between my teeth sparkling small machinery of want. What question can I ask of the thing I am, all I have done and failed to do, the furrows I tear with my grief mouth, a map of myself carved by my own horns. I have a name, yet no one who will say it not roughly. I am your native, and this is my American labyrinth. Here I am at your thighs, lilac-lit pools of ablution. Take my body and make of it, a nation, a confession. Through you, even I can be clean. And I'll finish on this, um, on this last poem. And I, I appreciate your generosity. Um, so a lot of people don't uh, know this. Uh, Native Americans per capita, ba meaning based on our population, are killed by police at a higher rate than any other, um, than any other race. Another thing we don't know is we are actually not a race. Um, we, 
we are a nation, we are nations. And it's important uh, to be counted in American law that we, that we, we hold ourselves as, a politi as political groups, um, otherwise we have no claim to sovereignty. Um, quote, Native Americans still volunteer for the military at a higher rate than any other, again, race in the country, um, including some of my, my brothers. And so it's just a, I just keep, keep thinking about the bad math of this country. I'll end with this poem. American arithmetic. Native Americans make up less than 1% of the population of America, 0.8% of 100%. Oh, mine efficient country. I do not remember the days before America. I do not remember the days when we were all here. Police kill Native Americans more than any other race. Race is a funny word. Race implies someone will win. Implies I have as good a chance of winning as who wins the race that isn't a race. Native Americans make up 1.9% of all police killings, higher per capita than any race. Sometimes race means run. I'm not good at math. Can you blame me? I've had an American education. We are Americans and we are less than 1% of Americans. We do a better job of dying by police than we do existing. When we are dying, who should we call? The police or our senator? Please, someone, call my mother. At the National Museum of the American Indian, 68% of the collection is from the United States. I am doing my best to not become a museum of myself. I am doing my best to breathe in and out. I am begging, let me be lonely but not invisible. But in an American room of 100 people, I am Native American, less than one, less than whole. I am less than myself, only a fraction of a body. Let's say I am only a hand. And when I slip it beneath the shirt of my lover, I disappear completely. Gracias. Thank you for having me. Can you hear me okay? It's a good volume. Um, my Lord, that feels good. <laughs> Thank you, Natalie. Um, it's always a pleasure to share the room with Natalie. Um, I was, uh, you know, starting a beginner poet um, back in New York years ago when, when she published, um, when my brother was in Aztec, and I thought, I felt the ground shift under me. And I'm just so happy to see her continue to innovate, dare, dare on the page, and dare um, the tradition to alter it, to make it new in useful, shimmering ways. Um, it's just such a great pleasure to witness that and be alive while it happens. Um, I was supposed to be here um, in Harvard last March, and on the day that I was coming, um, I got the phone call that altered my life. My mother was diagnosed with stage four cancer, and uh, she ultimately passed from it uh, in November. Um, so I, I missed y'all, but in my stead, uh, the, the legendary Fanny Howe, who's here tonight, um, read some of my poems, and um, I, I got to see a video of it, and I, I, I must say, my, my poems were even better in her muff. Um, so thank you, Fanny. Um, 
and, and also um, thank you to Jory Graham, who uh, we've, n we've never met until tonight, um, but when she heard about my mother, uh, she reached out, and it's wonderful when, you know, poets help each other out uh, under circumstances that has nothing to do with poems, and yet has everything to do with poetry. Um, so thank you so much to Jory. Um, thank you to Christina and Mary for holding this space and gathering us. Um, I feel good. I feel uh, firm. <laughs> um, I'm mostly soft, but um, sometimes I got firm bones. So I'll read some uh, new poems, which can be scary, but we'll see how it goes. This is called American Legend, and it's uh, inspired by Robert Creeley's I Know a Man. So I was driving with my old man, the day wasted save for the cobalt haze closing around us. We were on our way to kill our dog, Susan. I mean, we had to bring her to the clinic to put her down. Or maybe they meant put her in the ground, though I knew Susan would be ashed in the incinerator out back, puffs of smoke like little ghost poodles. Where was I going with this? Yes, the car, the rain, the legend of joy and pain, my old man and I driving, the Ford big enough for us to never touch, and maybe I made the hairpin turn too hard on purpose, and the thing flipped like a new law going 80. Maybe I wanted at last to feel him against me, and it worked as the colors spun through the windshield, wild metal clanking our shoulders, the sudden wetness warm everywhere. He slammed into me and we hugged for the first time in decades. It was beautiful and wrong like money on fire. The skin around his neck so soft, his aftershave somehow summer-like. It lasted not a second, but I swear he was smiling, his teeth already half gone, as if someone wiped them away to make room for something truer. Put it down on the page, son, he said one night after telling me why he did what he did with his life, shit-faced on Hennessy. We were sitting at the kitchen table before his shift at the cult factory. His eyes like raindrops in a nightmare. I touched him, then let go. The car stopped rolling. We hung upside down. Things dripped steam or breath. I did what any boy would do after getting exactly what he wanted. I kissed my father. He grinned, I think his pupils, three shades of white. I reached back, unlatched the cage. The dog stepped out, sniffed my old man, now cold, then ran into the trees, into her second future. I walked from the wreck till the yards became years. The dirt road became a city until my face became this face and the rain washed the gasoline clean from my fingernails until I found a payphone in the heart of the poem and called you, collect, to say all this, knowing it won't make a difference, only more. So hello, hi, help me. The blood inside my hands is now inside the world. Language, the gods tell us, destroys nothing it can't rebuild. I did it to hold my father, to free my dog. It's an old story. Anyone can tell it. Don't hang up. Stop saying no. Uh-huh, sure. Yeah, I'm still here. Yeah, I have the gun. I'm not scared. Just cold, okay, come get me. We can start over, all right, 
Oh God, I'm putting it down right here before you. Hurry. This is a long, weird poem. Not even this. Hey, I used to be a fag. Now I'm a checkbox. The pen tip jabbed in my back. I feel the mark of progress. I will not dance alone in the municipal graveyard at midnight, blasting sad songs on my phone for nothing. I promise you, I was here. I felt things that made death so large it was indistinguishable from air, and I went on destroying inside it like wind in a storm. The way Lil Peep says, I'll be back in the morning when you know how it ends. The way I kept dancing when the song was over because it freed me. The way the street light blinks once before waking up for its night shift like we do. The way we look up and whisper sorry to each other, the boy and I, when there's teeth, when there's always teeth on purpose when I throw myself into gravity and made it work. Ha! I made it out by the skin of my griefs. I used to be a fag, now I'm lit. Ha! Once, at a party set on a rooftop in Brooklyn for an artsy vibe, a young woman said, sipping her drink, you're so lucky, you're gay, plus you get to write about war and stuff. I'm just white. Pause. I got... Pause. I got nothing. Laughter. Glasses. Clinking. Unlike feelings, blood gets realer when you feel it. Because everyone knows yellow pain, pressed into American letters, turns to gold. Our sorrow might as touched. Napalm with a rainbow afterglow. I'm trying to be real, but it costs too much. They say the earth spins and that's why we fall, but everyone knows it's the music. It's been proven difficult to dance to machine gun fire. Still, my people made a rhythm this way. Away, my people so still in the photographs as corpses. My failure was that I got used to it. I looked at us mangled under the time photographer's shadow and stopped thinking, get up, get up. I saw the graveyard steam in the pinkish dawn and knew the dead were still breathing. Ha! If they come for me, take me out. What if it wasn't the crash that made me, but the debris? What if it was meant this way? The mother, the lexicon, the line of cocaine on the Mohawk boy's collarbone in an East Village sublet in 2007. What's wrong with me, Doc? There must be a pill for this. Too late. These words already shrapnel in your brain. Impossible in high school. I am now the ultimate linebacker. I plow through the page, making a path for you, dear reader, going nowhere. Because the fairy tales were right. You'll need magic to make it out of here. Long ago, in another life, on an Amtrak through Iowa, I saw for a few blurred seconds a man standing in the middle of a field of winter grass, hands at his side, back to me, 
all of him stopped there, save for his hair scraped low by wind. When the countryside resumed its wash of gray wheat, tractors, gutted barns, black sycamores, and herdless pastures, I started to cry. I put my copy of Didion's The White Album down and folded a new dark around my head. The woman beside me stroked my back, saying in a Midwestern accent that wobbled with tenderness, go on, son, you get that out now. No shame in breaking open, you get that out and I'll fetch us some tea. Which made me lose it even more. She came back with Lipton in paper cups, her eyes nowhere blue and there. She was silent all the way to Missoula, where she got off and said, patting my knee, God is good, God is good. I can say it was beautiful now, my harm, because it belonged to no one else. To be a dam for damage, my shittiness will not enter the world, I thought, and quickly became my own hero. Do you know how many hours I've wasted watching straight boys play video games? <laughs> Enough. <laughs> Time is a mother. Lest we forget, the morgue is also a community center. In my language, the one I recall now only by closing my eyes. The word for love is ew, and the word for weakness is ew. How you say what you mean changes what you say. Some call this prayer, I call it watch your mouth. When they zipped my mother in a body bag, I whispered, Rose, get out of there. Your plants are dying. Enough is enough. Body, doorway that you are. Be more than what I'll pass through. Stillness, that's what it was. The man in the field in the red sweater. He was so still he became somehow more true like a knife wound in a landscape painting. Like him, I caved. I caved and decided it will be joy from now on. Then everything opened. The lights blazed around me into a white weather, and I was lifted, wet and bloody, out of my mother, screaming and enough. And uh, I'll close with, with reading um, a poem from the novel. That sounds wild to say. Yeah. I, I, I knew that as a poet, um, I wanted to use a novel as a Trojan horse. To <laughs> get folks to read some poems. But in all seriousness, I, I always felt that there's an obsession in our Western culture for completion that something could be done, something could be finished, that to, to create art is to reach a finite, quantifiable endpoint, destination. And this very nation is founded on this false notion of a manifest destination. And I thought, what would happen if, we, if there's a novel that refuses closure, to refuses its own flesh, what if it fell apart in the middle, in a sense that is not so much a novel completed, but the ghost of a novel that would be there? What would happen when one orchestrates a novel as a liminal space, not on its way to something there, but entirely on its way? And so that was the idea, is to sort of um, stop noveling in the middle of it and allow the floor, the temporal reality that we ask so much of novels. You know, the critic John Gardner says, 
the biggest rule of the novel is to, to not break the fictive dream. And I think having grown up post 9-11, I felt that my generation was never allowed to really dream. And I felt what would happen if, if the novel stops dreaming of itself and starts thinking in poems, which is ultimately a unit of fracture. Um, and as a poet, I knew that that would be okay. That would not be an apocalypse. Um, because the poem is a, a medium that breaks itself towards unity. Um, so, here's my Trojan horse. <laughs> Thank you again. Trevor, trust, Trevor rusted pickup and no license. Trevor's 16 blue jeans streaked with deer blood. Trevor too fast and not enough. Trevor waving his John Deere cap from the driveway as you ride by on your squeaky Schwinn. Trevor who fingered a freshman girl then tossed her underwear in the lake for fun for summer, for your hands were wet and Trevor's a name like an engine starting up in the night, who snuck out to meet a boy like you, yellow and barely there, Trevor going 50 through his daddy's wheat field, who jams all his fries into a whopper and chews with both feet on the gas, your eyes closed, riding shotgun the wheat, a yellow confetti, three freckles on his nose, three periods to a boy sentence. Trevor Burger King over McDonald's, cause the smell of smoke on the beef makes it real. Trevor Bucktooth clicking on his inhaler as he sucked eyes shut. Trevor who says, I like sunflowers best, they go so high. Trevor with a scar like a comma on his neck, syntax of what next, what next, what next. Imagine going so high, he says, and still opening that big. Trevor loading the shotgun two red shells at a time. It's kind of like being brave, he says, like you got this big old head full of seeds and no arms to defend yourself. His hard, lean arms aimed in the rain. He touches the trigger's black tongue and you swear you taste his finger in your mouth as it pulls. Trevor pointing at the one winged sparrow thrashing in black dirt and takes it for something new. Something smoldering like a word, like a Trevor who knocked on your window at three in the morning, who you thought was smiling until you saw the blade held over his mouth. I made this, I made this for you, he said, the knife suddenly in your hand, Trevor, later on your steps in the gray dawn, his face in his arms. I don't wanna, he said, his panting, his shaking hair, the blur of it. Please tell me I am not, he said, through the sound of his knuckles as he popped them like the word but, 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 and you take a step back. Please tell me I am not, he said. I am not a faggot. Am I? Am I? Are you? Trevor the hunter. Trevor, the carnivore, the redneck, not a pansy, shotgunner, sharpshooter, not fruit or fairy, Trevor, meat eater, but not veal, never veal, he said, fuck that, never again, after his daddy told him the story when he was seven, at the table, veal roasted with rosemary, how they were made, how the difference between veal and beef is the children, the veal are the children of cows or calves. They are locked in boxes the size of themselves. A body box like a coffin, but alive like a home. The children, the veal, they stand very still because tenderness depends on how little the world touches you. To stay tender, the weight of your life cannot lean on your bones. We love 
eaten what's soft, his father said, looking dead into Trevor's eyes. Trevor, who would never eat a child. Trevor, the child with a scar on his neck like a comma, a comma you now put your mouth to, that violet hook holding two complete thoughts, two complete bodies without subjects, only verbs. When you say Trevor, you mean the action, the pine stuck thumb on the big lighter, the sound of his boots on the Chevy sun bleached hood. You're Trevor, your brunette but blonde dusted arms man pulling you into the truck. When you say Trevor, you mean you are the hunted, a hurt he can't refuse because that's something, baby, that's real. And you want it to be real, to be swallowed by what drowns you, only to surface brimming at the mouth which is kissing, which is nothing if you forget. He turns you this way and that to find his path through the dark woods, the dark words which have limits like bodies, like the calf waiting in its coffin house, no window but a slot for oxygen, pink nose pressed to the autumn night, inhaling the bleached stench of cut grass, the tar and gravel road, coarse sweetness of leaves in a bonfire, the minutes, the distance, the earthly manure of his mother, a field away, clover, sassafras, Douglas fir, Scottish myrtle, the boy, the motor oil, the body, it fills up, and your thirst overflows what holds it in your ruin you thought it would nourish him that he would feast on it and grow into a beast you could hide in but every box will be opened in time in language the line broken like trevor who stared too long into your face saying where am i where am i because by then there was blood in your mouth by then the truck was totaled into a dust oak smoke from the hood, Trevor, vodka breathed and skull thin, said, it feels good, said, don't go nowhere. As the sun slid into the trees, don't this feel good? As the windows reddened like someone seeing through shut eyes, Trevor, who texted you after two months of silence, writing please instead of PLZ, Trevor, who was running from home, his crazy old man, who was getting the fuck out, soaked Levi's, who ran away to the park, because where else when you're 16? Who you found in the rain, under the metal slide shaped like a hippopotamus, whose icy boots you took off and covered one by one, each dirt-cold toe with your mouth, the way your mother used to do when you were small and shivering, because he was shivering, your Trevor, your all-American beef, but no veal, your John Deere, jade vein in his jaw, stilled lightning you trace with your teeth, because he tasted like the river and maybe you were always one wing away from sinking because the calf waits in its cage so calmly to be veal because you remembered and memory is a second chance both of you lying beneath the slide two commas with no words at last to keep you apart you who crawled from the wreck of summer like sons leaving their mother's bodies, a calf in a box waiting, a box tighter than a womb, the rain coming down, its hammers on the metal like an engine revving up, the night standing in violet air, a calf shuffling inside, hoofs soft as erasers, the bell on its neck ringing and ringing, the shadow of a man growing up to it, the man with his keys, the commas of doors, your head on Trevor's chest, the calf being led by a string, how it stops to inhale, nose pulsing with dizzying sassafras, Trevor asleep beside you. Steady breaths, rain, warmth welling through his plaid shirt like steam issuing from the calf's flanks as you listen to the bell across the star-flooded field, the sound shining like a knife, the sound buried deep in Trevor's chest, and you listen, that ringing, you listen like an animal learning how to speak. Thank you.
If there is such a thing as American goodness, I think we've witnessed two of its great emissaries tonight. Thank you so much, Natalie, Ocean, and for all of you for coming in such numbers. I wanted to quote Natalie's uh, new book and say, and remind us, who lies beneath streets, universities, museums, my people. Thank you so much. Please join us at a reception afterwards at the Poetry Room. Hi, you're running us back? Yes. Hi, Thank awesome. you so much. I'm Peter. I'm Mike.